Today's episode is a fun one. Now, I say they're all fun because I think they are because I do this for a living. And I know all of you are at work either really enjoying it, you want to optimize your plan, you want to retire early. Some of you are just starting your journey, making sure that if you want to retire early, what can you do about that? For those that are new, I reframe that FIRE movement. I don't believe in that traditional financial independence, retire early. I believe in financial independence, recreational employment. Most people don't want to do nothing. They want to do something. They just want it to be fulfilling. And today's episode is a fun one because I'm giving you insight from a current client of mine. They didn't want me to disclose their name, so let's just call them John. And John, I know you're listening to this episode because you tell me listen to all of them, so glad that you keep doing that and hope that these are fun for you. Now, Today, this framework, like I said, it comes from John. I'm going to put my insight and my twist on it, but I'm giving you the three tips that when I asked John, what would you tell yourself 10 years ago as well as 30 years ago for an early retirement, um, what would that be? And they said, Ari, I'm excited to tell it to you. They didn't want to be a guest on the podcast. I am going to have other current clients come on the podcast in the future, but for now, just sharing the information this way. So, I'm going to walk through the framework, and as always, I have more information like this on YouTube if you want to follow along visually. In addition to that, I'm going to highlight a recent review. This one comes from Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, 54236, and Lewis, I, I hope I'm saying that right, they say, I want to make sure that I'm not leaving anything on the table. I feel I've done a good job, but just aren't sure. How do I know? Question mark. I want to make sure, sorry, three question marks there. I'm going to tell you, Lewis. Um, I want to make sure because I've worked so hard that once again, I don't go, dang, I wish I did this instead. So I like the way you said that, Lewis. You're making me laugh. Um, I want to go through this and show you how you don't go, dang, I wish I did this instead. So the first thing that I'm going to go through is what John alluded to, which is the true power of compound growth. Now, there's a really fun fun in my eyes. I'll let you guys call me a nerd, but there's something fun called a matrix book. And this matrix book is what I'll show a lot of clients that, that come on board with me. And what it does, it shows you all the average returns over the last hundred years, depending on how you invest. So some people go, Ari, I get it. That's why we invest. It's going to show me a high number. I go, yes, but you don't want to just invest in the S&P 500 alone. And here's why. The average return over the last 100 years is 10.5%. That's the average return of the S&P 500 from 1926 to 2021 when they finalized this study, which of course they're updating. But just the book I'm looking at and then we said, what if we put $1 in? $1 would have turned to $14,000, and that is significant. That is why people invest. Now, that's the S&P 500. But if you invest in small companies, instead of 10.5%, your average return was 12.1%. So that 1.6% higher return over the last 100 years turned $1 not to $14,000, but $46,000. So you didn't work any harder. You didn't do anything differently, but you invested well with intention, and you have a lot more money. Now, that's if you had small companies, but what if you took it one step further? So not S&P 500, not small companies, but small value companies. Not penny stocks or anything like that, but these are the companies, excuse me, that become the Apples and the Netflix and the Googles of the world, but they have to start somewhere. And these are the companies that when people say, Ari, you know, small companies versus big companies, what's the difference? One word, and that word is price. And so if you were in small value companies, your average return was north of 13%, 13.4 to be exact, and $1 didn't turn to 14000 or 46000 but $136,000. So people say, why do I invest? Why am I loving investing? Because I want you to be able to do more with your money. So my number one example here, that the, the first tip that comes from a current client with that little bit of context is invest for compound growth. Compound growth does not traditionally have to be large caps versus small caps versus real estate. It can be a training. It can be certification. It can be a degree. It can be anything that develops your skill set. What if that led to an average 1% extra growth rate per year? It would be significant. I just showed you if you invested well for many, many years that even if you just got 1.6% higher, and you can do that, of course, investing through paying less fees, getting better returns, it is significant. But Think about doing that in your actual life where you could look at a role that you're in and go, what if I could get a raise and that would tremendously allow me to invest a whole lot better? Okay, well, we tend to just look at compound growth on, on a chart, 
on a graph showing, great, if we invest this way, here's when we can double our money and here's where we'll be if we keep investing, awesome. But don't forget about compounding growth in your actual day-to-day -day life. Most people just overlook that. So that was a really wise, I think, piece of advice that John, once again, using the pseudonym there, that had advised me. Number two is while you're doing all of that, don't burn out. Let's assume that right now you're well into your career, okay? You're 60 years old, peak earnings years, but you're just totally burned out. And you're saying, Ari, I can only do this for one more year. And let's say that you're earning a very healthy income. Let's just say $350,000 or $400,000. Let's say three fifty, dollars And you find that there's part-time work that you just love, but it pays a whole lot less. So you're just saying, I don't know if it's worth it. I don't think I'd be able to meet my goals. Okay, but what if you could? Let's take an example. Let's just say you could meet your goals, and we'll walk through what that looks like. But if you could, would you do it? That's the first question. And that part-time work that you love, let's assume that that pays $50,000 a year. And you could do that until you're, you're 66, okay? And once again, um, let's say you're 59 today. It seems the same, meaning 350,000 bucks you could make in one year or 50,000 for seven years, but really 350,000 is really only taking 198,000 home, assuming you live in California, because of federal, state, and FICA taxes, which is Social Security and Medicare, payroll taxes, versus 50,000 a year, every year for seven years also equals 350 but you're actually taking a little over 40,000 per year net or $281,000 total so earning the same amount over seven years is actually $83,000 more profitable a 42 percent increase on top of this that's just financially you enjoy it which means I think you're going to keep doing it longer a lot of my clients that retire early once again, they retire early, that financial independence, recreational employment mindset is they don't want to do nothing. They want to be fulfilled. I'm going to bet you don't want to retire at 55 and then do nothing until age 90 or 100. You want to make sure that you live a fulfilling life. And for some of you, it's volunteering and not required to, to make finances work. But for a lot of you, if you want to retire early, you do need finances to play a big role still. And I want to make sure you get the most out of it. And I'd rather you, you leave a job that's not allowing you to take care of your health or get totally burned out as you can imagine john who who came up with of course this concept here that they were alluding to this is saying hey i was burned out i didn't love what i do i do part-time income now i love it and they wanted to share their story so if you can prevent yourself from pulling money out of your portfolio for longer that's a huge impact in terms of the income your portfolio can create in the future because if you were to stop working meaning you make three hundred fifty thousand in, in a given year at 59, you retire at 60, your portfolio is now going to get withdrawn significantly for your living expenses versus making 50000 a year, paying less in taxes along the way, meaning a higher net takeaway, and less is coming from the portfolio, allowing it to compound even more over time. And then the real last one here, um, live within your means the way you see fit. I want you to spend a ton of money on things you love and be, be very frugal on things you don't love spending on. You cannot out earn any bad money habits. When you have something known as human capital when you first start working, you're fresh out of college, you're worth a lot of money in terms of your ability to earn that over time. Now, as you get older, that human capital starts decreasing. There are only so many more years you can earn that. This is why you translate that human capital into financial capital. You take your income, you save it, you invest a portion of it. Over time, your hope, of course, is that financial capital becomes more and more valuable. So let's take an example here. Look at Warren Buffett. What's the value of the work he continues to do in terms of the income he receives? It's very high, but the actual value there is in his financial capital. The money he saves and invested so that even if he stopped working altogether, he has a tremendous amount of financial capital. Now that's obvious. To grow your financial capital, you have to maximize first the human capital. But what most people do, just speaking of my experience, that come to me, they fall in one of two categories. They either go, Ari, I've saved and invested so well, I want to get the most out of this. I want to make sure I can retire early. I don't love doing what I'm doing, but I don't know how much is enough, so I'm just going to keep working one more year, and then one more year, one more year, and then they never stop. And of course, they come to a spot where they do stop, but they worked five, seven, or ten more years than they wanted to because they didn't have a plan that gave them the confidence that if they were to retire early, they'd be okay in their 90s. Even with long-term care policies and otherwise, they were not confident. So that was the kind of number one group. The second group is we don't have enough to retire early because we lived large and, and we had a great time 
up until this point, and we do want to retire early because we don't love what we want to do. Um, we don't love what we do right now, excuse me. However, we don't have the ability to do so financially. So it's the, the first group of people, they have saved and invested well. They tend to keep working because it's what they know, they're comfortable in it, and they're maybe scared of the unknown. That meaning they don't know how they're gonna spend their time in retirement, which I know a lot of you are listening going, Ari, that's insane. If I could retire early, I know exactly what I would do. Awesome, if that's you. But a lot of people aren't that way. And they retire and they're like, I don't know what on earth I'm gonna do. I don't know how I'm gonna fulfill my time. I've poured so much into my employment that I really don't have a ton of extra curriculars I'm, I'm looking forward to. So they just keep working and they keep working. And it's not a bad thing for your financial plan, but it is for your life plan. Because what is that financial impact? And then what's the health impact? A lot of you are working really hard right now. And if you knew that you could retire two or three or four or five years earlier, then you think, what would that do to your day-to-day -day work? Meaning most people, and this is what John had a told me, hey, I want you to already really get this across to your audience, which is most of you are just thinking if you're 50 years old right now or 55 or 60, I want to retire in, in two, three, four, five years. I don't know if I can do it. Or I want to retire next year. I don't know if I can do it. Go find out. And if you find out that you can't retire early through going through a process with myself or another advisor, that's okay. I think you're going to feel better knowing you have a plan there. And I relate this back to what I call the I don't know phase of planning. I am a soccer player. I'm a, I played college soccer. In addition to that, my brother and I, we actually bought a semi-professional team. We didn't get a lot of playing time um, in college. And because of that, we wanted to control our playing time. We bought a semi-professional team and we, we're just having the time of our life. And so we're based here in Los Angeles, California, and I hurt my hip playing soccer. The worst time was when I did not know my PT, my physical therapy. I was in agony. Once I got an MRI and I got a diagnosis, I went, okay, now I saw my physical therapist. Here's the plan. I wasn't in misery for the three months of physical therapy. I was in misery before I knew. Once I knew, I was like, got it. I, this is what I have to do. I think it's the same for a lot of you. It's you just don't know. Are you on track or are you not? That's the first temperature check. Then you find out, wow, I'm three years out from an early retirement. Okay, it's going to make going to work every day a little bit easier because you know that light is there. You might go, wow, there's a creative way of looking at this. I want to get creative. What if I'm able to do some part-time income for a limited amount of time? I'm going to love it. Yes, it pays less than I, I'm bringing in today, but wow, that's an attractive trade-off to me. Okay, consider that. That's a real plan that a lot of people just don't implement because it's not traditional. I invite you become not traditional, but don't be cookie cutter. Make sure that when you're looking at your plan, if you could do creative tax planning, and that means you have to, you can work six months less, you know, good luck quantifying that on your health if you don't love your job. What if that's more time with family and, and more time fostering quality relationships? That's why I love an early retirement. It's not the sake of retiring early for early sake. A lot of people retire early and a lot of people retire early with confidence. And there's a big difference. A lot of people will retire early and they'll second guess taking that big trip or second guess going out to eat. And to me, that kind of defeats the purpose of a good early retirement where you're doing what you want to do. So to summarize all of this today, as John brought up wisely, compound growth. Think of it in investing terms. Yes, please invest well. At the same time, think of it in your skill set, certifications, degrees, training. Number two is don't burn out and consider part-time income as part of your financial plan. And then number three, live within your means the way you see fit. Expenses are the number one factor in a retirement. Taxes might be one of the biggest expenses, but expenses alone, determining what's going to allow you to feel really confident, it's hard. And I want you to actually go through that exercise. And if you're going, wow, I want a spreadsheet or a way to think through this, there's a ton out there. I've hopefully distilled it into the most effective one out there in the market. You're going to see it in my description if that's something you're interested in, in seeing. Click that link and you will get my custom retirement expense spreadsheet so you can at least know what you would need to spend so that you're on track. Some people it's 80000 a year. Some people it's 200000 a year. Neither is right, neither is wrong, but it's about determining what an early retirement looks like for you for success, not just the sake of, I did it, I retired early, but now I'm second guessing things. To me, I imagine most of you would rather work another year or six months or part time if it meant you'd be really comfortable in early retirement. So hope that this episode was helpful today. I know not quite as nuanced as some of my other episodes, but my goal here is for you to start thinking about your financial life a little differently and think of an early retirement in, in a really transparent way. So 
That's it for today's episode. Hope it was helpful. See y'all next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Early Retirement Show. If you have a question that you want answered in a future episode, you can always go to my website, earlyretirementpodcast.com. That's earlyretirementpodcast.com. And you can go ahead and submit a question that I'll look to answer in a future episode. Thank you all for listening. Please do rate it, review it, and share it with someone who you think would benefit from this information if there's anyone out there that you know. I certainly appreciate it, and I will see you all each week. Hey guys, it's me again. Please be smart about this. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as financial, tax, or legal advice. Consult with your tax preparer or financial advisor before taking any action. This podcast is for informational purposes only.